All right. So we had uh, three inquiries on the table. Uh, who is Tupac in your opinion? Um, what are the distinctions between the three versions of Pac that you see in each interview? And then what new revelations did you gain about Tupac through watching the uh, interviews? Who would like to start by sharing what was discussed in their breakout rooms? Yeah, I'll start. Okay. You know, Tupac, he was a, he's key. Tupac, he's considered one of the biggest rappers of all time. You know, he, he is a very humble guy at such a, a young age, I think 17 when he barely started. And I think in the first interview that I saw in the 1994 one, like he talks about how, how he doesn't want to go like, I think he's like, I don't want to go to jail, but if God puts me in that situation, then I'm willing to go, but I don't want to be there. You know, I live for the community. I just want to, you know, and then, and then with different cultures as well, you know, with Hispanic, he said, he, all, of, all of him, we went to his concert and he doesn't have any problem with it. He's just a very humble person. And at such a young age, you know, he made a lot of money. So it sucks that his, his, his life was cut up young, but he, he, he was able to produce and do what he loves, singing, rap, you know? So that's what we talked. Thank you, Santiago. Uh, who else would like to share? I'll share. Okay, go ahead. Um, so in my group, well, first of all, before watching these interviews, I knew Tupac as a rapper and I knew him as um, an activist and an actor. So I knew a lot about him, but not like as much as I did after watching these interviews about how he talked and um, what he said. But uh, one of the things that I was talking about in my group is the distinctions in the three versions of um, the videos that we saw. And I myself thought that I saw him getting, um, in the beginning video, he was like laughing and like uh, making jokes with the interviewer. And it almost felt like he was getting angrier in the videos that we saw because of the lack of change. Um, but a person in my group actually told me that they see that more as passion that it was like a passion for, you know, him being an activist and the people that were like around him, he had more of a following. Um, and going more into that a little bit, I thought it was also interesting about how the interviewer was like, you know, you're a celebrity and, you know, you have all of this, why are you, you know, so advocating about this? And he was saying that, you know, I do have the platform to talk about it basically. And I do have the people that I didn't have before. And he was referencing his dad. Um, too, like he doesn't have a dad. He didn't have these male figures before. And now he, that he does, he like some, sometimes doesn't know what to do with it because he's never, there's never been a Tupac. He's the first Tupac. So um, <clears throat> yeah, that's pretty much what me and my group were talking about. Yeah, thank you, Melanie. Uh, James, or Jake, excuse me, were you gonna say something, Jake? Yeah, I was, I was kind of gonna piggyback off of uh, Santiago and just talk about, you know, I like, he was a very profound thinker, I feel like, even from a younger age. And as as Melody uh, brought up, he was uh, he progressively got more, you know, like one of her group members said, passionate. And I think about uh, the uh, the quote from that um, 1994 interview where he says, I got a big mouth and I can't help it. I talk from the heart. I'm real. And I I really like that because he's like, you know, he's very down to earth and he's, you know, talking about like, you know, when he talks about certain issues, he's, you know, he's real about it, he's open. And I think that's what, you know, at least, and that also kind of relates to the journal. I feel like a lot of that doesn't happen in today's world. We like to push aside our issues and we don't like to really talk about the real issues. So. Perfect. That, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I, I was going to say that that's what I got from just talking with my group and watching the, uh, the interviews. So. Thank you, Jake. Uh, Nicholas, were you gonna say something? Yeah, I was gonna say something. Um, so I'm like, I, I'm 20 years old. I I didn't really know. I didn't really watch, grow up watching, listening to Tupac. My dad, he, you know, uh, he uh, he he's from Africa, so he didn't really listen to hip hop. So it was very like. Uh, Nicholas, my fault, bro. What part of Africa? It was Zimbabwe. Okay, so hold on. Hold on. I'm sorry, y'all. I got to do a detour. Uh, Nicholas, do you know Dr. Brickrieri? No, I don't. Okay, we um. When we get done today, hang out. I gotta set that up for you, okay? Because it's about other. Do you know um, Prince Gumbi? Uh, I think I do. It was I, like we got some Nigerian. I'm sorry, some Zimbabweans. Quite a few of them here on campus. But yeah, you know, I think I, I I think I know Prince Gumbi, but okay. You know, I would have to 
you know, I would want to see him first because I know I know one, you know, uh, yeah. Okay, so we have Prince and we also have a brother named Leon. I forget his last name. Um, he runs track, but um, I just had, when we're done, hang out because I want to give you Dr. G's um, information. It's, it's important. Yeah. It's imperative that you link with him. But I'm sorry. Yeah. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. So, yeah, I was just saying, like, you know, I always just knew him as like a, a rapper or a famous act or a famous, famous actor. I didn't even really even listen to his music. I seen the, the movies, but that's the only thing I really knew him as. And then in the me, I also seen that like you know he's always I did know him as like a thug and a gangster as well. But then, but then I, I realized that like um, I was, that that was really just the media portraying him and what he was really saying. He was really saying like real stuff. Like I went to the um, the black to his Tupac um, museum. And they showed like all his journals, like just random, you know, they had like notebooks full of all his writings. And it was like, he's actually really saying real stuff. He's really advocating for like, for, for, for people that need help. And, and then I feel like the media really just try to like, you know, they really put that thug on him. They really put that, that, oh yeah, you can't really listen to him. He's just, you know, like just talking. Like, I feel like he was really, Talking, but yeah, he that's what you know, he was a poet, he was an activist, he was that's what he was. Yeah. Uh Roxana. Yes, I, I wanna go back to what Nicholas said about the thug. I think it was um the second or third radio where he actually defined what thug was because a lot of people, um, uh, I even myself, you know, thug, oh it means something else, but it he really like Put himself in those shoes of what thug was because he has a tatted on him so he um explained what that was you know so i was able to learn that too and i feel um throughout his videos he did mention a lot about the poor and the rich and there's this part where i like where he said that um there should be a day where like the poor are rich and then the, the rich are poor and he did like start from the beginning to the end like he did that and i think another classmate also talked about him being passionate, like you felt that, like him being 17 years old, the way he spoke about his mother and even about his father, even though he wasn't really in the picture, he still had that respect for him, you know? And throughout the videos, like he continues to do that. And I feel the last video was a little bit more intense because I felt that he was so passionate, but he was just like over it, like everything that was being said, him being um, mad at Biggie and the gang related, like, oh, you're from this side and no, you're on this side. So I feel like towards the end of the video, he was really like over everything. Like, it's like, like I'm done. Like, I feel like I'm trying enough to this and that. But I feel like the last video uh, was more touching because you could feel and you could hear like he's so passionate, but he's so tired of the things that are going around. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, Brandon, we'll go, go with you for the last one. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to point out, I think in all three of those videos, one thing that stood out to me the most was, I think it's, it's his emphasis on respect. So each, each video had a lot to do with respect. And even when they were talking about him or saying the things they were saying about him in the media, it had a lot to do with respect and how he felt disrespected. I think that's a, a, a very astute call out. And I think how he deals with respect in each video revolves, or sorry, it, it evolves, right? So at first it's like, I'm young, I'm 17, I wanna have the respect of being an adult, right? And then it's like the lack of respect that the wealthy show towards the underprivileged and under and underclass and the poor. And then in the last video, the lack of respect that my person has been owed. And now that right. I've been disrespected, you have to deal with this disrespect. So I think that's a brilliant call. Yeah, out. exactly. Yeah. Okay, so um, let me jump into my notes and I'll, and I'll try to move through them rarely quickly just because of, um, I wanna hear from y'all more than myself. Um, but, but for me, um, Tupac is one of those central figures. Um, I, didn't, I didn't grow up with Malcolm X. I didn't see Malcolm X in, and that's before my time, but Tupac, I, I seen him, right? Like I seen him evolve in, in front of my eyes. And, and it's interesting because it wasn't the uh, social media era but he was very much had a social media type presence to where the things that were going on with him, everyone was made aware of it. He's one of those individuals that literally grew up in front of our eyes. So, I mean, cause you gotta think with that first interview um, where he's 17, I wanna say a year later, he filmed Juice and that's his, his debut film, right? So um, he literally grew up in front of our eyes. But one thing, I think it was, I don't know if it was Roxana 
or Brandon talked about this idea of real and, and how realness for Pac was foundational. And, and to me, this is a, a temporal thing, right? This has to do with time. So for me growing up, right, the, prop, the popular saying was keep it real, right? And you had to be authentic. You had to be thorough, right? And what you didn't want to be was front. And, and your respect would be diminished by your ability to front, right? And so in cultural studies, right? I'm getting my PhD in cultural studies. They say that you could tell a lot by a culture by its language. So if that's the case, right? And for some reason in the um, early to mid nineties, the lexicon of that culture was to keep it real, then you know that that culture had a high priority in all authenticity, right? And this is really manifested through hip hop, right? And, and hip hop culture. There's also a, um, a, a very large desire, especially in the first interview, to be uh, ready for adulthood, right? He articulates a lot his desire to be prepared for being an adult, right? Um, and then also, he's, he's, he's high, and, and a lot of you called this out, he's hyper attentive to social issues, right? He's high, hyper attentive to social norms, social problems, right? And also the fact that the youth will inherit the world that the, the generation before them left, right? And it's the job of the youth to improve on the conditions that were left for them, but it's also a subtle critique on those who came before him as they left him a dismal world, right? Um, and then, you know, the importance of his mother. Um, she is a, a reoccurring presence in, in all of the films, um, all of the interviews, and really throughout his life. Um, but also for Pac, he finds a, a usefulness in struggle. He finds a usefulness in hardship, right? He figures that, you know, to be able to go through hardship makes you ready for the real world. And he feels that those who grew up under privilege that did not experience those hardship, they're not as prepared for real life as those who have gone through the hardship. And to me, that, that, that's very profound. And then like he, he articulates the four takeaways that he gained from his mother was respect to, to Brandon's point, right? Knowledge, speak your mind to Jake's point, but listen, right? Listen to gain understanding. And he gives us the example that his mom used to always tell him, you have two ears with one mouth, right? So by definition, we should be more hearers than we are speakers. So moving to the 94 um, interview, I agree with, with, with Jake, right? Like this idea of my big mouth, right? Um, he said it always gets him in trouble. But he also says like, I'm trying to find my path, right? And, and I think at 20, in 94, he may be like 23 at the time. And I'm 38, right? And I'm still trying to find my path. So I can only imagine that being in the spotlight at 23 years old, the type of row shit that I would have said, right? So I, I get that. Um, and I also love how he explains the evolution of the message in hip hop, right? So the, the, the interviewer asked him like, you know, how do you go from like Grandmaster Flash to gangster rap, right? And he, and he brings up the example of, well, if you hungry, and, I'm, and there's a hotel and I know in this hotel y'all eating hella food. The first time, you know, I'm gonna knock and I'm gonna be polite, but there's more times that I get denied food and the hungry and hungry I get, right? The message and the sound of my ass is gonna change, right? And it's gonna go from, we are hungry, please let us in, to I'm picking the door, coming through the lock, blasting, right? And this is what he says. And, and, and I think we see that playing out in our time right now. If y'all pay attention to what's going on in the streets, folks is getting robbed. The stick up kids is out. What's going on with our economy? How high is gas? Who could afford a home? To buy a car is fucking ridiculous, right? So as the economic situation decreases, crime increases. And this is exactly what Pac is pointing to. Um, he says that we asked in the civil rights movement, right? We asked, we were, Asking him, even though it's more aggressively with black power and all them folks are dead or in jail. So now what do you expect us to do? Ask? Nah. 
Um, I also love the idea, and again, it's 1994, the prophetic nature of his conversation, right? He says, society is leeching off the ghetto. And, and to me, I liken that at the time to black culture, right? Um, box braids were unprofessional and ghetto. Long nails, unprofessional and ghetto, right? Thick lips, big booties, unprofessional and ghetto. Now, everybody want to have thick lips and big booties, long braids and long nails, right? That's a, at a time that was ghetto culture, but now it has become mainstream. This is exactly what Pac is talking about. Um, one of my favorite quotes, quotes from Pac of all time is, I'm not going to change the world, but I guarantee I will spark the mind that changes the world. Um, and I think that's profoundly brilliant. And, and for me, that motivates me as a, um, as a professor, right? It may not be me in my words and my thoughts that changes the world, but it may be one of y'all, right? Um, this idea of, who has heard the term, the rise of a black Messiah? Has anyone heard of that? Does that sound somewhat familiar to anyone? So y'all may, may be more familiar with the movie Judas and the Black Messiah um, about Fred Hampton, right? I think maybe two years ago that came out, but they get this term from J. Edgar Hoover and the Cointel Pro files. Cointel Pro is a central intelligence agency, the CIA's um, covert operation to eliminate black power movements, right? So from um, Marcus Garvey to Martin Luther King to Malcolm X to the Black Panther Party, Cointel Pro has been involved in derailing those movements under the idea that we will eliminate the rise of a black messiah. What is a messiah? What is a messiah? What is a messiah intended to do? It's a message for change. Uh, I mean, just to like generally, like it's like a authentic, the real message like for change. It's absolutely a message, but I think Suliata Simpi more put his savior, more put it um, spot on, right? It's a savior or liberator or someone who's giving the message of salvation or liberation, right? And so if the idea of Cointel Pro of the CIA of the Central Intelligence Agency is to stop the rise of a black messiah, then we were gonna murder folks like Malcolm X. We're gonna murder folks like Martin Luther King, right? We're gonna derail movements like Marcus Garvey. So where does Pac come into play with this? Pac says, imagine how you would feel to go to a concert and everyone in the concert will do exactly what you say to do. I'll tell them to turn around, they'll all turn around. I'll tell them to jump up and down, they'll all jump up and down, right? Then I get off the concert, I'm getting phone calls from triple OGs asking me, give me the word and I'll do whatever you want to do. That's power. And Pac said himself, that made me afraid. To have that much power made me afraid, but I knew if I was afraid of that, there are other people who were more afraid of that, right? Remember who his mom was. <laughs> Remember who his mom was. This gives him that level of analysis, right? So what was happening, Tupac himself was becoming that black messiah, right? And he tells you, I've never got any legal trouble, trouble until I made, became famous right? Then the system began to come into play to derail his life's purpose. Um, thug life, right? He says, I'm going to insinuate a code for thug life. Roxana says she gleaned a new understanding of what it is to be a thug. He provided a new definition for her of thug, right? I don't know how many of y'all know that thug life is an acronym. The hate you give little infants fucks everyone. The hate you give little infants fucks everyone. That's the acronym for thug life, right? So he's speaking for the infants who received hate by this society, right? And those are the people who he's becoming the Messiah for, who he's delivering this message for, for the downtrodden, the wretched of the earth, the subaltern, right? Um, also, right, he's organizing 
the gangs to provide a street code to the way that street activity should be conducted, right? And to ensure that the civilians don't get harmed in street life, right? So really he's doing a more effective job of policing his community than the police are doing, right? But again, I, 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 I invoke you to remember who his mother was. Um, and I'm gonna, I'll leave it with this. I'm not gonna get into this. Th I'm gonna say one brief thing about the third interview, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of wrap it up with this. I love this equation that he draws of what's the difference of John Mills saying, give me liberty or give me death, besides me saying, fuck it. It's the, sa it's the same thing he's saying. So how is it that certain people are, ab are able to advocate for their freedom, for their liberty, for their justice, for their empowerment, and that's okay, but my folks can't, right? And um, the one thing that I'll say about the last interview, um, and, and I, and I kind of think that, um, I, I kind of feel Jake, or was it Jake or was it Melody? I think it was Melody. There is, while there's, the passion was always there. That's consistent through all videos, but the anger does increase on that third video. And, and I don't think there's a distinct, I think there's a very large distinction between his passion and his anger. He tells you, I'm pissed off, right? I may give you the uh, award show, you see me smiling and all that, but now nah, don't get it twisted, homie. I'm pissed off, right? He felt he was done wrong, right? And, and I think where you see, um, in the third interview was a byproduct of the male ego, right? Of the damaged male ego of someone who is authentic but has been done wrong, right? And here's a, here's a deeper part, right? Done wrong by someone who is his boy, right? Or by people who said that they loved him, right? So especially from coming, someone from, coming from someone who is authentic Inauthenticity does not resonate well with them, especially if I've been real with you. So if I'm being real with you, you've got to keep it real with me. And when you show me otherwise, you're going to get my wrath, right? And this is the, the anger, the tension, and the displeasure that you see manifested in the third video. Um, you know, so to look, to look at Melanie's um, question in the, in the, in the um, chat, I don't think it was directly being in jail that fucked him up. I think it was how he was treated while he was in jail is what kind of got him um, fucked up. But then also not to dismiss once he got out of jail, who he partnered himself with, right? And, and that really put him on a whole nother trajectory that he wasn't, I don't think intended to be on. Because when he was in jail, he was really on a different path. He was really about establishing this code uh, and really about, and he also organized a gang truce in Los Angeles from jail. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So this is what he was on. And then when he gets bailed out, I think Suge pays a million dollar bail. And at this point he's um, indebted to Suge for seven albums. Um, but it wasn't just the music business of it. It was the culture that Suge kind of, promoted through death row records that kind of also got um pop in, in, in a, a situation that was unbecoming for him does that answer your question melody okay cool cool so what i would like to do um uh, is and, and autumn i got your message I, I i'll set that up with you as well um but what i would like to do is open this up either to the fishbowl so if you have not done two fishbowls you probably want to do that soon because we're coming to an end, but then also um, just open up to a broader conversation. Um, does anyone need to fishbowl before our semester's up? If you're unsure, I'll say just do it so that way you're covered. Uh, okay, Melody, uh, so we'll put you down. Anyone else? Uh, Suleyan Sethi, we got you as well. Anyone else? And Albert. How do we know that we that we passed? Uh, I have it written down, but I, I'm not about to go through all that right now, Santiago. No, I know, but like like later, like like send you a message, like later, I like uh, email you or yeah, email me. And I I could look through it, but I, I believe you went twice. I I want to say, or at least if not twice, for sure once. Yeah, I want to just make. I'll email you though. Yeah. Okay, so um. We have Melanie, we have Suleyana Seppi, and we have Albert. Whoever wants to start it off, it's on you.
I'll start. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about what I was asking you and also his perception changed about God's plan. That's another thing that we're talking about in the group is before in the interview, um, before he had said that he was going to jail or he didn't know he was going to jail. He said, if I do go to jail, um, I know it's God's path and I know, but he said at the same time, you know, I don't think that I deserve that. I don't think I deserve to go to jail, but I know it's for a bigger reason. And um, one of my members in my group, I think it was Brandon, was pointing out about how in the last interview he was saying um, <clears throat> some things against God in a way. I, I forgot exactly what he said. So it's kind of like he was almost angry at God um, about, you know, actually going to jail. And another thing that I noticed about him um, being in jail was that he was saying that if he does go, he knows that he's going to, everybody there is going to love him. He's no, he's, he knows that he's going to have people there for him. And in the last interview, it seems like that wasn't the case. People were angry and, you know, he kind of mentioned rape. And I don't know if that was, if he did get raped or, you know, if that was, if he was involved in it. Um, but that was something that, was very interesting to me the the way that the, those two interviews changed versus before he was in jail and then after he was in jail. Um, I'll answer it more fully in, in a bit, but what I do want to just real quick, Melanie, just for you. Um, so it, not necessarily in the sense of the love that he was receiving in jail. What he's saying is, I know folks in jail, right? The the cons, if you will, they're gonna have love for me. But what happened was the people outside of jail, right? The people in society still, the people in the media, the people in the music business, those were the ones who were talking shit about him while he was in jail. As we said, like Donnie Simpson was a, um, a host for the show back in the day on BET. Um, and he's talking, to, so he's a, a, media, a media member, right? And he's saying Donnie Simpson putting up bars talking about who am I, I'm Tupac. So he's not talking about the people within prison. He knew that they would have love for him because that he's a spokesperson for those people. But it was the people in the media, uh, the people in the music business who did not have show that same love. Who's next? Um, I can go. Um, so what I thought was interesting was when I was looking at like the revelation, I guess, of all the videos. At first, I was I thought like it was whiteness, but it was more plight in a way he was being polite like so as he goes on you can see and it's anger but it's out of passion like it's 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 um what's the word like it should be anger like what else should yeah. you expect so i i get a better understanding of that but also um sorry i had a point that i was going to speak on um what was i going to say I just think it's I like he's a great figure in a way, not only for African Americans, but just for all people of color. Like we should fight, speak up. Like what else are we gonna do? Just let these institutions and systems um, I guess holding like hold us back and letting us struggle. And I'm just grateful, I guess he sparked or he did spark um I guess a generation where we're, a lot of people are speaking up now. I, it's not like we still need to, there's still a lot more that needs to be done, but I'm just glad that he was a great figure and he's looked at, looked at as more of a positive view. Well, he was still back then, but still, he's still respected. So, yeah, yeah. That, that's, the, that's a good point. I said, because I'm, you, if you think about how like Malcolm X, right, has really been vilified and, and, and there's like a whole host of people who, don't feel comfortable with the message of Malcolm X, right? Um, due in large part because of the media influence. And we've seen that reflected in the last week's discussion. You don't really see that play out with Pac. And, and I think that's interesting why there's a difference. So that's a very good point. Um, Albert? Uh, I will say I had no idea who he was, what I got from the interviews were, him talking about the educational side in the first interview. Mm -hmm. I feel, I feel that I live in the fairy tale. He says, so I feel clueless about most of the world, what's going on and what's happening. Yeah. I feel my parents are like what he said. Are they yeah, me up and talk parents? Yeah. And what are basics about the our K to twelve education, which we can still relate today a bit. Yeah, thank you, Albert. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, I'll keep talking. Yeah, go ahead. If you, if you oh, and the second interview, 
He talked about the suppression when they will eventually break. Oh, he talked about going to jail and using it as a time to reborn himself. And then talking about the dog life code, his order uh, in life. Oh, his music, how it wasn't seen as hip hop, but it was a, a war he was creating. The forgotten roles of today, or oh, how karma works. Oh, and, and at the last interview, he talked about God and the church and what is God doing and not helping the homeless. Mm -hmm. yeah, yep. I personally can't relate to these, but only to the first interview. And that's all I Thank you, Albert. Um, actually, it's it quite, quite profound. And actually, you did a, a great job of addressing one of Melody's questions because she was like, she, Melody question, you know, it seems like in the in the second interview, he is allowing to surrender. He, he's surrendering to, you know, God's plan, if you will. So if I got to go to jail, that's part of God's plan. I'm rolling with that. But then in the third interview, he seems to be at odds with God. So to Albert's point, right? He's not at odds with God because he went to jail. He's at odds with God for not attending to the needs of the downtrodden, to attending for the needs of those who he is speaking for, right? And that's his rift with God, you know? Um, yeah, yeah, I, I'll leave it at that. And then we'll also say, Melanie, in regards to your um, question about the rape situation, um, no, he was not raped. Um, and, and he's very emphatically denying the rape, right? If you listen closely to what he's saying, but What's happening is while he was in jail, people were writing articles and making spreading rumors about him being raped to the point that um, he had little girls writing him letters, you know, praying that he was OK, you know, and he had to go about um, responding to those letters to let them know that he is, in fact, OK. And he has he would never be raped. Um, according to him, he said, you have to take my life before I'm raped. So that's where the rape kind of comes in. Um, but all of those things. Um, accumulated with you know being robbed and shot five times and all the major music players in New York are on the scene right but no one has any answers as to why he was robbed or he was shot right all those things kind of accumulated to put along with the um, plight that Suliana Sippy is attentive to right all those things placed together placed him in that state of enragement right it placed him in a space to where he would be angry right and who wouldn't again at this point he's 25 right who wouldn't be angry who wouldn't want to respond in that in, in that type of fashion right um but I, I'll, I'll leave it at that i want to hear from others to kind of get their thoughts on tupac on our conversation excuse me on the interviews um we'll just open up to a broader conversation Um, I got some. Or right, you, you can go ahead. You go, Brandon. <laughs> okay. I think one thing I wanted to um Albert just reminded me was the um the critique of education and knowledge. It kind of reminded me of uh one of the uh the journals that we read. I can't remember the name of the title, but it was uh it was talking about the harmful spirit possession and things of that sort. And when he with his critique of the educational system and he put an emphasis on reading writing arithmetic and they keep teaching you the same thing over and over and over again instead of teaching you um things that you're going to use in real life right so he's basically his critique of school being a more traditional type of practice instead of somewhere where you can you can learn like actually using it as a learning tool is just a place for you to Put, put your kids when you're busy at work and they're uh, they're learning the same thing over and over again. So they're not really learning. Um, and it reminded me of that that article that we talked about. Yeah, so it's a great connection, Brandon. Uh, Roxanne? Um, overall, I just wanna say I'm 
it was the first time that I saw the the video when he was 17 and like I'm a fan of Tupac but I never came across that and I was just like it was an eye-opener to see how being such again being such a young age the way he was thinking and it's just like you follow that that path that that you know as he grew up and stuff like that and just the knowledge that he had at that that age and I have a more understanding why a lot of people um like Tupac and how they could relate because his songs were about like true stories you know about what was going on and I feel like I could relate because I myself you know I I grew up in the ghetto I still even live in the ghetto it's like to live and die in LA you know that's my song right there and I relate to that and I was able to have like a more understanding of what the word thug is or the word ghetto because you hear people say oh you're from the ghetto and they get like this um feeling about it but like you said a lot of people forget where they come from and like I myself like I grew up here and I continue to live here and like I'm proud from where I am only because I'm ghetto doesn't mean that I'm not going to have a future or education or I'm going to end up on being part of a gang because that's what people think being from South Central they expect you to get pregnant at an early age they expect you not to be someone and just to be stuck here and it's just like um it just made me feel like a lot of things you know so thank you for um having us watch these videos like it's a, a really like a big eye opener yeah and, and I, I think for me right like part of the reason one I, I think these three individuals are very interesting depictions of manhood from from that standpoint alone right but like these are also individuals who their reputation precedes them Right. And it's like, I think I know Tupac. I think I know Malcolm X. I think I know Nipsey Hussle, but you don't really engage those individuals at their level. So what I thought was like, yo, let me kind of expose you to an alternative depiction of these inner individuals from their own mouths. Right. Like hear from them and not from other people. And also being attentive to the fact that, right, like shit, 95 was 30 years ago. Right. And the music lives on, but we're so far removed from that time, it's out of context, right? So I, I think it's important for especially, you know, y'all generation to understand, one, why he was important. And it's not strictly the music, it's not the acting, it was the message, right? Um, and, and all those other things from a cultural standpoint, right? It, it, it bleeds off of that too, right? Like motherfuckers wasn't wearing Versace before pop, let's just call that what it is, right? He's, he's a trendsetter in that regard. Um, everybody's tatted now, right? Nobody was really tied like that before pop, right? Um, so there's, there's, there's other things I could kind of go into that he set trends for, but I, I want to kind of dispel the legend of him and get down to the essence of who he is, right? And, and, and I think um, those interviews, one, depict the evolution of him and, and, it, and it gives you a, a very um, insightful look into his thought process as well, yeah. Um, other thoughts, questions, comments, concerns? Tonight, you've been quiet. I'm just checking in. Uncharacteristically quiet today. You good? Um, who have you heard me from? Lucia, what were your thoughts on the uh, videos or the conversation today? Um, the conversation overall to me was very like, um, it was very positive. I feel like, um, sorry, that was, I was sorry, sorry about that. Um, but I feel like um, he's very wise on his years. Like he explains things in a certain way where it's like you gain this different perspective and seeing it and viewing it. And I think it's very important because him at a young age, at 17, um, having so much knowledge and so much, um, so much knowledge, so much um, being able to express something in a way that it's so like profound and meaningful to everybody else is very important and it's significant. And I feel like um, this discussion was very um, eye-opening because I only used to see Tupac as um, a rapper, artist, an actor. And now it's like, I could see him as more things other than just that. So I feel like um, it really opened up my, the, like um, how I viewed him, like the scope of the way I viewed him. Mm -hmm. So I feel like um, this conversation is very insightful. And um, I'm glad that we had this conversation because there was so many things that I did not know about him. So now that I do so, that's very good. You know, uh, one thing I wanna kind of dive into a little bit deeper real quick from what Lucia says, right? He said, he, he's very wise. 
And I've, I've been saying um, consistently throughout this discussion, remember who his mama was. Why am I saying that? Why is that important? Who knows? Because his mother was a, a Black Panther. So her, her teachings from when he was a, a young kid, he basically lived with that. Yep. Like he was taught this at a very young age. So he seems a lot more, not even he seems he is, a lot more wiser than people around his age. He's a lot more wiser than people older than him because of who he grew up with, which is his mother. And basically that, the uh, Black Panther ideology. Yeah, exactly. That's it. So what you guys were all picking up on, that's a byproduct of being a, in the home of a Panther. That's all that is. That's, that's, that's all that is. And, and not to, to devalue his intelligence, obviously he's a brilliant individual, right? But it's that foundation that allows him to be able to manifest that brilliance at this capacity that we're all, that all leaves us in awe, right? Um, so yeah. Any other last minute questions, comments, or concerns? Uh, I had a question. Um, so the saying that basically about the, uh, the two, two ears and one mouth saying, I know I've heard that in so many black households. Was that something that stemmed from like the Black Panthers? Or is that just something that we just we just said? Because it, it seems to be popularized in the black community a lot. Yeah. I, 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 I can't say for certain, but if I had to bet some money, it's an African proverb. I, I, I don't know, but it just, to me, it's, it's just oozes Africa to me, right? Um, and, and the African culture is steeped in these type of sayings because folklore is used to make sense of the world, right? Folk, folklore in Africa is epistemology. So we'll have a saying that will help you to understand something. And again, I, I don't know concretely that it's coming from Africa, but in my soul, right? I just feel that that's where that derives from, you know? Um, I, I believe that that far predates the Black Panther Party. Um, somebody in Ghana or somebody in Zimbabwe or somebody in Nigeria was shooting that off before white folks even got foot on Africa. That's just, how I believe in my soul. Yeah. Good question, though. And it's a profound statement, right? Because what's going to be more useful for gaining knowledge? Talking all the time or listening? It's obvious. Um, any other last minute questions, comments, or concerns? Okay. So for next week, let me kind of show you all where to go. So next week we'll be uh, jumping into Nipsey Hustle. Uh, so please watch these three interviews. Two are really short. This one, the the fifty two minute one with Ebro Nam is a really really good interview. So we'll, I'll probably be spending most of my time in discussion with dealing with this one, but we'll engage all three. Um, but but the Ebro interview is, is really profound, and you'll see a lot of um, intersections between what Malcolm's talking about, what Pac's talking about reflected in, in Nip's conversation. Um, outside of that, y'all, 